In this lesson, we're going to examine phase diagrams. These useful diagrams show how both temperature and pressure can influence phase changes. Have you ever used a pressure cooker? My husband loves them for cooking because he says they shorten the cooking time by two thirds. But how do they work? These airtight pots allow gas pressure to increase inside well above atmospheric pressure as you heat the food. But how does this shorten cooking time? So the water that the food is cooked in inside the pot is heated to its boiling point, and then it stays at that temperature while the food cooks. But remember that the boiling point is determined by the atmospheric pressure. At boiling, the vapor pressure of the liquid must equal whatever the atmospheric pressure is. And if we cook the food in an open container, uh, that pressure is likely around 101 kilopascals. So the water reaches 100 degrees Celsius, and that's the temperature at which the food cooks. Inside a pressure cooker, though, the pressure can actually increase to almost two atmospheres or 200 kilopascals. And as you remember from our vapor pressure curves, the water temperature must be much higher to reach that pressure. Our curve doesn't actually extend that high, but if it did, we'd see that the water inside a pressure cooker can actually become superheated to about 120 degrees Celsius. Higher temperatures, faster cooking. So the temperature at which water boils depends on the atmospheric pressure. And it turns out that the temperature of all phase changes between solids, liquids, and gases, all these phase change temperatures are somewhat dependent on atmospheric pressure. And a phase diagram is a common way of showing these relationships. So all phase diagrams have certain general features in common. Temperature is displayed on the x-axis, pressure on the y. And the diagrams are usually divided up into three regions representing the solid, liquid, and gas phase. Since the solid form of any substance is usually found at lower temperatures and higher pressures, the solid phase region is almost always in this location on the left-hand side of the graph. Gases are usually associated with higher temperatures and lower pressures. So the gas phase region is always in the lower right of the graph. And of course, in between the solid and the gas region, you'll find the liquid. Separating each of these regions are three lines known as the equilibrium lines. At the temperature and pressure combinations along the lines, the two phases on either side are considered to be in equilibrium, and both phases can coexist. So along the line between solid and liquid, the temperature and pressure combinations actually represent a series of melting or freezing points for that substance. And between the liquid and gas region, the equilibrium line actually represents a series of boiling or condensation points. And you can see it follows the same basic shape as the vapor pressure curve. Finally, between the solid and gas region, we have the line for sublimation and its reverse process of deposition. So it represents a series of sublimation points or deposition points for the substance. Another common point on all phase diagrams is the triple point. So this is where all three phase change lines meet. And it represents the one pressure and temperature combination at which all three phases are considered stable for that substance. So solid, liquid, and gas can all coexist. They are at equilibrium.
Another way of saying this is that they have steady state concentrations for all three phases. They'll exist and none of them will be transitioning into one or the other stage. Now many substances also have a critical point. So this is where the vaporization condensation line ends. And above the temperature and pre pressure combination represented by the critical point, the liquid and gas phases are indistinguishable from each other. The pressure is high enough that the gas particles are forced close together, while the temperature is high enough that the liquid particles have a lot more thermal energy and expand. The net result is that the densities of the two phases become identical and the division between condensed and vapor phase disappears. Here we have the phase diagram for water. And you see the same basic structures we saw in the general phase diagram, but now we have temperature and pressure values for the equilibrium lines, the triple and critical point, that are specific to water. So all three phases of water are stable and coexist at the triple point, which for water occurs at 0.6 kilopascals and 0.01 degrees Celsius. The critical point for water occurs at a very high pressure of 22,089 kilopascals and a temperature of 374 degrees Celsius. So above this point, the liquid and gas phase of water are indistinguishable. Now here is 101 kilopascals, which represents normal atmospheric pressure. And if we read over to the phase change lines for freezing and for boiling, we see that we have a freezing point and a boiling point that we're familiar with, zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius for boiling. If you change the atmospheric pressure, you change the temperature for these phase changes. And the effect is more dramatic for the boiling point, which has more of a curve associated with that phase change line. But there is still some change with the freezing point and pressure. Water is unique in that the phase change line between the solid and the liquid actually leans to the left. For most substances, it leans more towards the right, so it's more like this. But for water, it turns out that the crystalline form of the solid ice is actually less dense than liquid water. And this is why ice floats. If you apply pressure to get those ice molecules closer together, you disrupt that solid crystalline form. And the ice will actually melt. And you see this effect at the bottom of glaciers, where the high pressure of the ice mass above causes melting at the base. And the liquid water that forms at the base helps the glacier to move. So this is a satellite uh, photograph that shows the advancing edge of the Perito Moreno Glacier in Argentina. And the meltwater that forms beneath the glacier from the pressure of the ice mass above helps reduce friction between the glacier and the surface of the earth below, and it helps that glacier actually move forward. So here's the phase diagram specific to carbon dioxide. And notice the different values for temperature and pressure for each of the phase change lines and the triple point for carbon dioxide. So the pressure axis is actually scaled in units of bar, which is a different unit, but it's essentially equal to one atmosphere. One bar equals one atmosphere. And this is actually a logarithmic scale, so it's, it's not to a linear scale, as you can tell. It goes from one to 10,000. But it starts right at atmospheric pressure, which is equivalent to one bar. And as we expect, carbon dioxide is stable as a gas at this pressure. Standard temperature of 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin is right around here, right at 300 line. And if we wanted to get carbon dioxide into a condensed phase, you'd have to increase pressure and lower the temperature. 
So the triple point of CO2 is actually 5.2 bar and 216.6 Kelvin or negative 56.4 degrees Celsius. You can also see that the equilibrium line between the solid and liquid, the melting and freezing line, actually curves to the right, unlike it did with water. So solid CO2 is more dense than the liquid CO2 and is the more stable form at higher pressures. One of the most interesting things about carbon dioxide in its phase diagram, though, is that uh, its critical point actually occurs at temperatures that are pretty close to room temperature. The critical temperature for carbon dioxide is 31 degrees Celsius. The critical pressure is 73 atmospheres or 73 bar. And this is significantly higher than atmospheric pressure, but it's a pressure that can be relatively easily achieved with laboratory and factory compressors. And this means that it's not that hard to actually get carbon dioxide above its critical point. And when we do this, since the liquid and the gas phases are no longer distinguishable, we actually call any substance above its critical point a supercritical fluid. And supercritical fluids are unique in that they actually possess both properties of liquids and gases. And one of the most important properties of supercritical fluids that we can utilize in a lot of different things is that they can penetrate different materials like a gas will. But they can also dissolve substances in those materials like a liquid. So in the food processing industry, supercritical carbon dioxide extraction has actually become the standard method for decaffeinating coffee and for removing fat from things like potato chips. So for extracting caffeine from coffee, the supercritical uh, carbon dioxide is mixed with soaked coffee beans where it can penetrate the beans and dissolve the caffeine within it. So caffeine, this is the molecular structure of caffeine, it actually has um, significant polar and nonpolar regions, and this allows it to dissolve in a variety of different solvents. Um, the nonpolar regions allow it to actually dissolve in the supercritical carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide, of course, is a nonpolar molecule. So when the carbon dioxide penetrates the beans, it dissolves the caffeine and carries it out of the beans, and then we can remove the uh, supercritical carbon dioxide and caffeine from the beans into a separate uh, container where they are mixed with water. And of course, the polar regions of the caffeine mean that uh, the caffeine can actually uh, dissolve in water as well. And so we extract the caffeine from the nonpolar carbon dioxide using aqueous water. And then the supercritical carbon dioxide can then be reused to extract more caffeine from more coffee beans. And the water and caffeine can then be purified to make caffeine that can be used for other purposes as well, like adding to your sodas. Now, the real beauty of this method is that the supercritical carbon dioxide does not leave any solvent residues in the food. So the other common solvents that can be used to extract things like caffeine um, tend to be pretty nasty solvents. A lot of them are carcinogenic. When we use supercritical carbon dioxide, though, it doesn't leave anything that could influence the flavor or the texture or prove harmful to anyone who eats it. So now that you know the general features of a phase diagram, you should be able to use one to determine the most stable phase at any pressure and temperature combination or to predict how the phases for that substance will change as you increase pressure or temperature. So next, test yourself with some practice problems associated with this lesson.